1 John. 1 John, as we continue looking at this little letter of 1 John, we are making our way into chapter 2 this morning. Uh, Chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. We will not have enough time to cover the whole sermon, so we're going to have to finish it next week, and I don't like to do that because inevitably some of you will be here this Sunday, some of you won't be next Sunday, or some folks will come in next Sunday that weren't here this Sunday, and I guess that's the beauty of having internet and, and being able to listen uh, in other means to catch up. So I want to encourage you to be faithful, to be consistent as we walk through. This is one big letter from John. This is not broken up by him. It's one big letter, and, and if at all possible, I want to see us walk through it together and pick up where we left off and learn from what we got last week. And one thing we saw last week is 1 John 1, 9, if you remember... Uh, as we began to conclude that message, it promises us that if we confess our sins, then he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. And, and I want you to just let that soak because that's where we left off last week. And there is a tendency when you read 1 John 1, 9, if you don't continue on, there is this, there's this tendency or this, this idea that might be given to some people as they read this, it may seem like John is giving us permission to just live however we want to live and to do whatever we want to do because we can always just run back to God and confess our sins and be forgiven and, and have a clean slate. And we, we talked about that some last week and what confession is and what confession isn't. But as we continue on today, I think we're going to see John removes all doubt that that is not at all what he's referring to. And I want us to be very careful because as we look over the last 50 plus years of especially Baptist life, we see where that idea has been picked up and it's been used in Baptist churches to say something like, if you admit and you believe and you confess then you are saved and you don't ever have to worry about your salvation again. You don't ever have to question your salvation. And that leads to people walking down an aisle and repeating a prayer that we treat like a magic formula. It leads to people repeating a prayer and getting baptized and joining up with the church and then walking out of those doors and living like the devil for the next 30 or 40 years. And they may be Easter Easter lilies or Christmas poinsettias, you know, and show up twice a year. And maybe on Mother's Day if mom's still living. And then when they die, the preacher stands over them. This is the worst part of the whole thing. The preacher stands over them and says, well, we know little Johnny when he was seven came forward and repeated the prayer and was baptized as a member of the church so we have comfort in that I want to say you have no comfort in that there's zero comfort in someone who would treat the gospel of Jesus Christ like it is a magic phrase you pray a magic set of steps you go through and then you pick up and live your life like you want to live that's not what Jesus taught That is not what Jesus taught, and we're going to keep fleshing that out through 1 John, so if you enjoyed that, you can look forward to more, and if you didn't, you can look forward to more. Because it just repeats itself in 1 John. That is not what he's teaching, and if there is any doubt whatsoever that John is is not saying that, well, we just need to pick up here in chapter 2 and read what he says. My little children, this is right on the heels of if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, well, does that mean I can sin? Does that mean I can live like I want to live and I'm good? My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may sin it up, live it up, do what you want to do because you're good now. Right? Once saved, always saved. You got, you, you, you're good. I believe. I want to make it clear. I believe in once saved, always saved. I'm a Baptist, and you are too. But I want to make it very clear that I believe only you're always saved once you're really saved. you got to be really saved to be always saved, not just check off some stuff. And John says, these things I'm writing to you who are really saved, that won't treat the gospel like it's, like it's a plaything, that won't treat the gospel like it's religion. I'm writing these things to you so that... You may not, what? Sin. Very clear. Very clear. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. 
Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. By this we know that we have come to know him. By this we know that we have come to know him. Because we walked down an aisle and repeated a prayer and got baptized and went through the baptistry. No, that's not what he says. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his what? Commandments. The one who says I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a what? Liar. Now, this is not me. This is me preaching here. This is John preaching. It's a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word... In him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Now I want us to see a few things from this text this morning. The first thing I want us to see is the purpose of what John is writing here in this portion of his letter. The purpose in chapter 2 verse 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that... Here's his purpose. I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Now, notice he doesn't say, I'm writing these things to you so that you can be a little better than everybody else around you. I'm writing these things to you so that you won't sin as much as that neighbor that you have. I'm writing these things to you so that you won't be quite as bad off as your co-workers. I'm writing these things to you so that you can be a step above everyone. No, he said, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. So if there's any question at the end of 1 John 1 of whether or not John is giving permission to just sin because of quote-unquote grace, he takes it away here. And he says, thank God, if we confess our sins biblically as true believers, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of all of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if we are true believers, my little children, your goal will be my goal, and that is not to sin at all. Is that your goal? That's John's goal for us. There's no other way to read that than for John to say, my goal for you My purpose for you in writing this is that you may not sin. That's the purpose. I want you to think back in Genesis chapter 17. It's an interesting transaction that goes on between God and Abram. And in Genesis 17, 1 and 2, God comes to Abram when he's 99 years old. And he said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be what? blameless I will establish my covenant between me and you and I will multiply you exceedingly walk before me and be blameless okay now if you go back in Genesis chapter 12 we're probably familiar with a text where the Bible says I'll bless those who bless you I'll curse those who curse you and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed God is calling Abraham out from his land to follow him to a place that he would show him Abraham follows him in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6 we find another encounter between Abram and God where Abram believed the promise of God and the Bible says in Genesis 15 and verse 6 that God because of Abraham's belief God counted it to him as righteousness. Are you familiar with that text? Are you familiar with that scripture? Abraham believed God. Abraham believed God. And God counted it to him as righteousness. Righteousness is blamelessness. Righteousness is holiness. Righteousness is purity. Righteousness is sinlessness. Now watch this. God comes to Abraham. Abraham has faith and believes. And God counts it to him as righteous he declares him righteous by faith and then he comes to him in Genesis 17 after he has been declared righteous by faith and he says Abraham walk before me blamelessly that's the Christian life friend God gets a hold of us through his gospel God draws us to himself through his gospel we see the fact that Jesus Christ has lived the life that God required of us he kept the standard that God set for us Jesus went to the cross and died the death that we deserve was buried away in a barred tomb and on Sunday morning resurrected from the dead we look at that we put all of our chips in that basket we put all of our hope there we cast our gaze there we put our faith there and God says because of Jesus Christ and the faith that you have and what he did for you on the cross you are what righteous you are blameless 
You are holy. You are declared positionally righteous. And then he comes to us like Abraham does, like he did Abraham in his word. And he says, now walk blamelessly. But God, I'm already blameless. I'm already, I'm already righteous. I'm already pure. I'm already holy because of what Jesus did by faith. Yes and no. Yes, you are positionally righteous. But now you've got to be practically righteous. You've got to live out what you are. Now notice very clearly. You're not working to be declared righteous. We're not saved by works, right? We're saved by grace through faith. So you're not working to be declared righteous. Jesus worked to declare us righteous, and now we work because we have been declared righteous. We're becoming who we are. Abram was declared righteous in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, and then he lived a righteous life and became what God declared him to be through the rest of his life. The same thing happens in Matthew 5, 48. Jesus comes along and he says, You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. We say, I am perfect. And the way I'm perfect is because of Jesus Christ and what he did for me on the cross. Yes. I am positionally perfect. Not because of me, not because of who I am, not because of what I've done, but because of who Jesus is and what he's done for me on the cross. I am perfect in the eyes of God. Now be perfect. Live it out. Strive to become practically what you are positionally. Ephesians 1.4 Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be, he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world so that we could be holy and what? Blameless. Jesus makes us holy, and then practically we work it out in an effort to live a blameless life. So here's the point I'm making. We are saved by grace through faith, and we are declared righteous. But because we have been declared righteous, that doesn't give us a license now to live however we want to live. Because we've been declared righteous, it stirs us up to now live righteously. Because we have been positioned in a righteous place, it stirs us up to practically live out righteousness. Does that make sense? So the, the point John is making is, as a believer who has been made righteous, who has been declared righteous, one sin is too much sin to tolerate. How many of us tolerate sin in our lives? We've got this little pet sin in our closet. And we go to God and we confess our sin. And in the back of our mind, oh, we're, we're guilty. We, we want forgiveness. We want cleansing. But in the back of our mind, we know, I'm, I'm going to pull that one back out when things settle down. And I come to God with the intention, in the back of my mind, of resurrecting that little sin back there that I just love too much to turn loose of. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do we agree with John that one sin is too much sin? If you hide one rebel in your house, you are a traitor, right? Now we're at war, the enemy's invaded, and you hide one traitor in your house, one, one rebel in your house, and you are a traitor, right? Thomas Watson put it this way if there is only one nest egg, the devil can brood on it. One dead fly will spoil the whole box of precious ointment. A drop of poison will spoil a whole glass of wine. One disease is enough to kill. One millstone will sink a man as well as a hundred. No compromise. No compromise. No compromise. If I go into battle and I suit up and I have on my armor and I go into the battlefield and I forget one piece, one piece of my armor, the enemy is going to aim where? Where I don't have, I may as well have went out without any armor on at all. If I'm not going to put on all the armor, I, don't, I may as well not go out into the battle at all with any armor on. If I leave one piece off, there's a clear target for the enemy. And that's how many of us treat our sin. We've got this one little pet sin back here that we keep in the closet and we don't want to confess and we don't want to repent of and we want to hold on to it because we love it too much to turn it loose. And that sin may be something as quote-unquote subtle as unforgiveness and bitterness or it may be something as serious quote-unquote as adultery. Or anything in between, one nest egg, Satan can brood on it. 
One sin is too much sin. In the words of Robert Candlish, he, he summarized this point of John in these words. Let it be deliberately set before you as your fixed and settled purpose that you are not to sin. Not merely that you are to sin as little as you can, but that you are not to sin at all. That's the, that's the standard. That's the goal. That's the purpose. That's the hope. Are you with me? I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Now, I want us to see not only the purpose, but the possibility here. Because John, I mean, is John just preaching? You know, you hear the folks, well, he's just preaching. <laughs> he doesn't really mean that. Is John just preaching here? Does he not really mean what he says here? John says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. I'm giving you this letter, and I'm writing these truths to you so that you can take these truths, believe these truths, embrace these truths, apply these truths, and live these truths in the light of God, and you may not sin. He gives us this possibility here. We have to assume that it is possible not to sin when we walk in the open fellowship with God and in His pure light, or John would not be writing these things to us to give us this possibility. Now you may be thinking, well, you know, it's not, not really possible, preacher. John is hypothetically speaking here. Let's play this hypothetical game. That pet sin you have in your closet, pretend that you're all alone and you open the closet and you go and get your pet sin and you bring it out, and you're about to sin, whatever it is. Gossip, bitterness, unforgiveness, gluttony, adultery, fill in the blank. Whatever it is, you're about to sin. And all of a sudden, I slip up behind you with a knife this long, and I put it to your throat and say, you do it, and I'm going to slice your throat. How many of you are going to say, too bad, I'm sinning anyway? No, you're going to say, okay, I'm backing off at this point. Now, that right there shows that it is possible, right? I mean, if you're going to lose your head... If you step into this closet and commit this sin, it is possible. And you say, well, that's pretty extreme. Well, Jesus was pretty extreme in Matthew 18, 8 through 9. He says, if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame with, than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. And I had a professor one time say, everything in the Bible can't be taken literally. If you took this literally, you'd be plucking your eye and cutting off your hands. And I say, wait a minute, let's back up a minute. Was Jesus meaning this literally? I mean, would it be better to go to hell with two hands or to go to heaven with one would it be better to lose a hand in this temporal life I'm not advocating you go cut your hands off by the way but it would it be better to lose a hand in this life this temporal life and spend eternity in heaven would it be better to lose one eye in this life and then spend eternity in heaven I think he's being pretty literal heaven is glorious hell is horrendous and in your bodily parts that are temporal are only temporal so hey do what you got to do to live out a holy life. Again, I'm not saying go cut your eye out, cut your hand off or your foot off. What I'm wanting you to see is that one sin is serious, and Jesus takes it seriously, and he says, you know what? Put a knife to your throat before you sin. Treat sin that serious. Put a knife to your throat before you sin. There is a possibility. This is a possibility. First Corinthians 10, 12 to 13. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is what? Faithful. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of what? Escape. Also, so that you will be able to endure it. So listen, if there is a way of escape for every sin... Every temptation, if there is a way of escape, is it possible that we could take that way of escape? Yes or no? Is it possible that we could take the way of escape every time, if every time God says there's a door of escape, there's a way of escape, there's a way out of this, take that door. Is it possible that we could take that? So it is possible. It is absolutely possible. Let me give you the words of Robert Candlish again. He says, it is but too true that in all that we do, we come short of this sinless aim. 
I mean, probably this morning, if you got more than 1.2 kids, you may have sinned getting to church. So let's just give a little grace here as we set the standard up. Robert Candler said, It is but too true that in all that we do, we come short of this sinless aim. That, however, is no reason for our not only anticipating fault or failure, but acquiescing in the anticipation. That's what we do, isn't it? We say, well, you know, I'm not going to ever be sinless, so I'm just going to go ahead and assume I'm going to fall. Hey, I'm just going to fold. I heard a Christian say, this is the way God made me. So I'm just going to be who I am. That's dangerous. Because who you are and who I am is not who Jesus is. I'm a Christian. And I may have been born this way. But God is making me another way. And his name is Jesus. And the purpose of 1 John 2 is so that we will see the deadly danger of sin and say, I'm setting the standard where God sets the standard. Holiness, blamelessness, sinlessness, perfection. That's what I'm going after. And I know that it is possible in Christ Jesus. I know that I'm going to probably fall short here. But I'm not going to set my standards here. I'm going to aim for the stars and hit the moon. I want to leave you here. So we got to go on. I'll try to get you to Sunday school. I want you to see not only the purpose and the possibility, but the pleader. Because John doesn't leave us here. John says, look, you confess your sins, he's faithful and just, to forgive your sins, cleanses of all unrighteousness, but lest you think I'm giving you a license to sin, I'm writing all these things so that you may not sin. And it is possible to live out practically what God has made you positionally through faith. It is possible to work out your salvation with fear and trembling because of what God has done in you and through you because of Jesus Christ. And now... Lest you get discouraged because you have an extra difficult child or an extra difficult spouse that you're trying to get ready for church on Sunday. Lest you get discouraged. If any of us sin, any true believer, any real believer, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous and he is the propitiation for our sins. Advocate means pleader. It is someone who pleads our call. So there's a purpose, there's the possibility, and then there's the pleader. An advocate is one who pleads the cause of another in a court of civil law. So imagine Jesus standing before the throne of the God who made us positionally righteous and is declaring that we should practically work out that righteousness. And when we fall, Jesus is there pleading our behalf saying, Whoa, whoa, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. I'm your mediator. I'm your advocate. John is assuming that we are in earnest. That sin is to us exceedingly sinful and holiness above all things desirable. That's what he's assuming. Sin is exceedingly sinful and holiness is above all things desirable. And we have really purposed in our heart in good faith that we will not sin again. We've not confessed our sin with our little sin stuck in the closet back here that we like to pet, that we want to bring out in the future when things calm down. No, we have, we have turned on that sin totally. And, and when we come to Christ that way, we have an advocate. When we, when we confess our sins that way, we have an advocate. And his name is Jesus Robert Candlish again says, We need not therefore be afraid to walk with the Father in the light. We may walk too often unsteadfastly. We may give new offense. We may incur new blame. But see, there is the intercessor ever pleading for us. Is that good news? Our advocate is with us, encouraging us and assuring us of complete victory. He's beside us to help us if we do stumble. He's there to lift us up if we do fall. And if any of us sin with the intent of overcoming sin and living a holy, blameless life, if any of us do stumble, any of us do fall, we've got an advocate. We've got an advocate in the Father with Jesus Christ. I want you to turn over to Revelation 5. Um, last week... I hope you remember we looked at Revelation 4. If you don't remember, I'm going all the way back through it. So do you remember Revelation 4? Yes, or do you want me to go all the way back through it again? You remember it. Revelation 4, picture of God on the throne, high and lifted up, glory 
in the temple, shining like a diamond, surrounded by an emerald rainbow, surrounded by 24 elders, surrounded by these four beasts. They're all proclaiming His holiness. All attention is on the throne. Well, I want you to see our advocate here, okay? In Revelation chapter 5. In Revelation 5, John is caught up in this moment, and he says, in, that, in, there in Revelation 5, I saw in the right hand of him who was sitting on the throne a book. And this book was sealed up in front and back with seven seals. I'm giving you the paraphrase. You can read it at home. This book was sealed up with seven seals, and there was no one in heaven who could open the book. No one could open the seals in heaven, on earth, or under the earth. So it's as if this strong angel has said, Who is worthy to open the scroll and its seals? Any of you angels? No. Any of you elders? No. Any of you beasts? No. Well, what about on earth? Is there anyone on earth that can open these seals? Any deacons down there? Any preachers? Any missionaries? Any evangelists? Anybody on earth that can open these seals? Seals, no, no one can. What about under the earth? Abraham, Moses, all the prophets of old. Is there anyone that can open these seals? And there is no one in heaven, on earth, or under the earth that steps forward to open these seals. And then John says, I began to weep bitterly. I mean, this is serious to John. He wants to know what's in this book. He is caught up in the holiness of this scene, and he wants to know what's in that book. And he is weeping bitterly. A grown man pouring out tears, saying, I want to see, I want to know who's worthy to open the book. And I love this. One of the elders stood up and said, quit crying. He's like, suck it up. There is one who can open the book. There is one who is worthy to break its seals. And well, who does he say? If you're looking at, if you're looking at Revelation 5, I love this. I'll try to resist from preaching on this now. But I love this. He says, the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is worthy to take the book and open the book and break its seals. And then notice what John says. He says, there's a lion of the tribe of Judah. And John looks and turns and he sees what? What does John see? A lamb. As though it had been slain, standing in the midst of the throne and the beast and the elders. I love that. The elder says there's a lion that can open the book. And John turns and he doesn't see a lion. He sees a lamb. I, I, this is just speculation. I'll stop preaching now and do a timeout. Okay, you're not going to pay for this. This is just extra information. All right? I'm just going to speculate. And I'm not a scholar. But if you have never been brought to a, a, an awareness of your sin and been brought to repentance and faith, when you see Jesus, you see a lion. That elder, he had, not, he had not been brought to repentance. He had not been brought to faith. He had never known Jesus as Savior and forgiver. He was in heaven. And he looks and he sees a lion. But John had seen his sin and he had seen his failure and he had, he had seen how miserable he was and how much he needed grace. And when he looked at the lion, he saw a lamb. And I, I just want to propose that that's a possibility this morning that if you are not a true believer, when you look at Jesus, you see a lion of the tribe of Judah who will judge the quick and the dead. But if you have been brought to repentance and you've been brought to faith and the grace of God has been poured out in your life, when you look at Jesus, you see a lamb who's been slain. That changes a lot, doesn't it? And John, we'll go back to preaching now. John sees the lamb. And get this, the lamb goes up to the throne. Imagine the audacity. I love using this with, with Muslims. Uh, we did a lot of work with Saudi Arabians back in Clinton, and, and, and they don't believe that Jesus is God. And I love taking them to Revelation 5, because here is Jesus walking up to this throne that we saw in Revelation 4. And he reaches out and he takes the book he takes the book from this God on the throne. Who has the audacity to walk and approach this throne and take that book? Jesus. And then notice what happens. The four beasts turn their attention from the throne in Revelation 4, and they turn it to the Lamb. Those 24 elders turn their attention from the throne in Revelation 4, and they turn it to the Lamb, and they sing and write and compose a new song right there on the spot. This is in verse 9. They sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God 
With your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, you have made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Notice what they're doing. is Here is the one who made us right with God. And he deserves worship and he deserves praise. So the beasts praise him. The elders praise him. And then what happens? The angels begin to praise him. Myriads upon myriads and thousands and thousands of angels begin to praise Jesus Christ. And it doesn't stop there. It says, then the birds of the heaven begin to praise Jesus. The beast of the field praise Jesus. Those things that are under the earth praise Jesus. Everything praises Jesus. I want you to, know, I want you to see That if you see the standard God has for us and the sinless perfection and blamelessness that we should be striving for and attaining for and that is possible. And then yet we see how miserably we fall short on a daily basis when we see Christ as our advocate. It should cause us to erupt in praise. One day, one day, listen, one day the angels are going to praise. The birds are going to praise. The fish of the sea are going to surface and praise. The bears in the woods are going to praise. The cattle on a thousand hills are going to praise. Even the worms under the earth are going to surface and praise. And even Baptists are going to praise because of what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. I don't know about you. I don't know about you. But I want to be practically what I am positionally I'm tired of playing games I'm tired of having my little closet sin I'm tired I'm tired of fooling around zero compromise blamelessness purity holiness will be the standard of the day and it is possible because God has made it possible and when we fall when we stumble Rest in the fact that Jesus, our advocate, lifts us up, holds us up, and represents us to the Father. And all heaven and all earth sings his praises as he does it. Do you know the advocate this morning? Do you really, do you really know Christ? I hate to stop here because there's more that we need to cover, but we just, you know... I'm used to preaching an hour, folks. You, you're going to have to take it in twos. And we'll see the rest of this. I hate to stop here, but man, our pleader, our advocate is here this morning. And he is pleading our cause. And, and if you don't know him as the lamb who was slain to take away your sins, get this, get this, you can know him today. You can be made positionally perfect and righteous today. No matter how sinful you were last night, no matter how sinful you were last week, no matter how big of a hypocrite you may have played for the past 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, you can be made absolutely perfect and righteous this morning and made capable of pursuing that practically this morning if you will just come to Jesus Christ. Repent of your sin. Throw open the closet doors and lay it all on the altar before Christ, turning away from your sin and putting your faith and your trust in Him and Him alone. He will give you new life. He will make you a new creation and He will plead your cause from this day forward if you will come to Him this morning in repentance and in faith. Would you do that? Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for Christ who makes us perfect, who gives us the possibility of living out what we have been made and who pleads our cause as we trip and stumble and fall along the way. God, we are thankful for Christ. And I pray this morning that there is a person in this place who does not know you. If there's a person in this place who does not know you as the Lamb of God, I pray that you would convict them, draw them, break their hearts. Break their hearts here this morning. Bring them to their knees. Humble them before you. Grant them repentance. Grant them faith. Grant them new life. Make them a new creation. Give them joyful assurance that you are beside them before them and with them 
as their advocate. And it's in Christ's name we pray and ask these things. Amen. If God's spoken to you, moved you, challenged you, you respond as he would lead you to respond during this time as we sing.